Hello and welcome back to a, another week of the weekly news on the For the Property Investor podcast. And of course, it wouldn't be the weekly news without Nick, who brings it to us. Welcome, Nick Bendel. Thanks for having me, Owen. It's always great to be here and it feels like it's just seven days ago since we last spoke. I know. Time flies when you're having fun, isn't it? Hmm. We always have fun on these chats and I always come out of them a little bit wiser because you share a lot of interesting insights. Oh, thanks, Nick. I do try. Um, but I guess that's the only thing I can do in these chats because you bring the news. So, um, yeah, I, I have to say something about it. I bring the news, you bring the insights and the rants. <laughs> well, yes, I've been accused of being a ranter before, but um, yes, for for the sake of trying to make this interesting for people listening, it's, um, yeah, we, we uh, I need to make it uh, a little, little entertaining. Well, I'm sure the listeners and the viewers appreciate that. I always like your rants as well. They're partly educational, mostly entertaining. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Appreciate it. Um, what's been happening in your work week in the last week? Well, uh, something interesting happened last week. I own a business called Hunter and Scribe, which is a copywriting agency that writes content for finance and property professionals. And one of the things we're really, really good at at Hunter and Scribe from award submissions. We know how to write award submissions in such a way that they maximize a person's chances of winning awards. I've written lots of award submissions. I've been an awards judge. And funnily enough, last week, uh, coincidentally, I had four different parties contact me to ask for help with awards. There was one lawyer, one financial advisor, and two mortgage brokers. So maybe if there was some sort of awards for the number of award inquiries that someone had received, I would win that award. Fantastic. Well, well done. I will have to hang on. I'll look around. Um, how about a bottle of water? Here you go. Um, uh, congratulations. Well, thank you. I'm very honoured to have that award and I'd like to thank my parents. Yes, and don't drink it all at once. <laughs> and what's been happening since we last spoke in, in your world and Leafield's world? Oh, lot, lot, lots have been happening. Um, We've uh, had a very busy month, the uh, start of the month, and uh, with lots of new managements. It's um, good to see that Hunter Valley in New South Wales is still going strong. Um, we've uh, many more managements coming on board there. But um, it's interesting to see the uh, fluctuations in the rental market across the country, which um, I, I think you've um, got a story coming up for us with uh, covering something like that. Yes, stay tuned. We might very well be discussing that soon. Okay. Well, let's get into it, Nick. What's what's um, the first story of the week in the news? Our first story today, Owen, RBA tells borrowers not to expect rate cuts in the near term. Inflation, which is currently at 3.8%, is taking longer than expected to return to the target range of 2 to 3%, according to the statement on monetary policy published by the RBA. While inflation is forecast is forecast to fall to 3% by December and 2.8% by June next year, uncertainties remain. Quote, on the one hand, there could be further delays to returning inflation to target if the labour market is tighter than we think or if the pickup in GDP growth is stronger than we expect, the RBA says. On the other hand, the labour market could soften faster or further than forecast if demand turns out to be weaker this would lead inflation to be lower than we expect. If inflation stays high for longer, so will interest rates. RBA Governor Michelle Bullock told the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Economics that the Reserve Bank, quote, does not expect that we'll be in a position to cut rates in the near term. Oh, no, I guess the big question before we talk rates is, how confident are you that the Reserve Bank will be able to defeat inflation? Well, they're very determined to uh, to do it, and they'll do it no matter what. So, um, uh, very confident that they will defeat it. Uh, it's just a matter of time and uh, being patient, and um, you know, uh, notwithstanding 
the efforts of the federal government to pump more money into the economy, <laughs> which keeps inflation up. So, yes, while that's happening, we're going to see um, these higher interest rates for longer. Now, it's interesting you should talk about the government because the Reserve Bank, there's only so much they can do. They have only one lever that they can pull and it's interest rates. They can move them up or down and, and there's only so much that interest rates can do. But the federal government has a much bigger influence over inflation and therefore interest rates than the RBA does. So I'm wondering, Owen, mm. should the government be doing more to fight inflation by spending less and or taxing more? Uh, absolutely. Um, but it's a political hot potato to do so. And um, is, is there an election next year? Yes, I think there is. Um, so, uh, yes, they want everyone to be happy for as long as possible. Um, another reason for, for maybe uh, introducing four-year terms. Um, and um, so when it comes to... Uh, the, what the federal government could do, yes, there's lots that they could do um, in terms of raising taxes or cutting spending and so on. But, um, you know, it's, it is a, uh, a, uh, a delicate thing to balance because, of course, they, we don't want to slip into recession either. Mm. So it's um, to be able to do that, you need the people to have jobs, you need people to be able to, um, you know, keep spending, but more modestly. Um, and I think we're seeing that and it's, but it's just uh, coming in for a very, very, very soft landing. Um, and, um, you know, uh, with a little bit of turbulence on the way down. So would you like the government to spend less or tax more or both? I, I think it could be a, a balance of both. Um, I, I know that in the federal budget earlier in the year, they they tried to do both. And it's, um, yeah, you could criticise them for, in one way or another, um, for being able to being able to do a better job. But, um, yeah, nothing specific on the radar of what they could do right now. But, um, Yes, we're in a position where we can say, yes, government, you should always be doing a better job of um, um, being able to bring down um, interest rates quicker. But of course, um, they would be called heartless and um, out of touch with the electorate if they, uh, if they did so. All I heard in that statement of yours was that you want our listeners to pay more tax. You really are heartless. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. Thanks, Nick. You know how to pick a headline, don't you? <laughs> I do. Uh, would you believe I used to be a journalist? Right. Okay. Well, that, that explains a lot. Yeah. Now, speaking of governments, let's move on to our second story. Senate to hold another housing inquiry. The Senate Economics References Committee will hold an inquiry into Australia's financial regulatory framework and home ownership. The inquiry was initiated by the coalition and will be chaired by the Assistant Shadow Minister for Housing, Andrew Bragg. To quote Senator Bragg, the nation can do more to support the aspiration of first home buyers. Australians must be able to have access to a mortgage as a prerequisite for a first home, he said. We will generate more options to tilt the scales in favour of first home buyers. We will investigate lending practices by banks and private credit opportunities to drive deregulation, competition, and consider eligibility barriers to first home finance, such as HEX. Owen, Senator Bragg said we need to, quote, examine how Australia's financial regulation can drive home ownership. Is he right? Oh, it's, um, it's just disheartening when politicians keep focusing on, on, the result they're trying to get instead of fixing the symptom. And um, it's, um, or I should say, the root cause of the problem. Um, it's, um, 
yeah, in terms of our financial regulation has been so well examined and so well rewritten. Um, it, it's it's gone through the ringer so many times in the last what fifteen years. We had the GFC um, when everything changed um, with regulation um, after the GFC in, in the late two thousands, and then we had the Banking Royal Commission in in the late um, 20 teens and everything that um, came as a result of that never got um, uh, implemented because it was just uh, a, a ridiculous but as a result the the banks changed the way that they were doing things and so so the amount of regulation rewriting that we've had in the last 15 years has just been huge and it's been tremendous and yes all they're trying to do again is um uh trying to focus on getting this result um treating the symptoms instead of the the root cause of the problem hmm. well uh, another thing that bragg said is that we need quote more options to tilt the scales in favor of first home buyers is he right about that um, that, well, that's that's what everyone would like to see. That it would be easier for first home buyers to get into the market, but how are they going to do that if they're just going to up the first homeowners grant and make it easier for them to get into the market quicker? Then that's just going to and, and they'll put caps, you know, on on you know, what sort of amounts in terms of uh, the the purchase price. All that does is boost the prices of those properties uh, under that ceiling um, quicker. So all it does is push prices up. We've seen it time and time again over the last, what, 25 odd years since um, these first home buyer schemes have, have been coming in. And it, it's, um, we need our politicians to start focusing on the root problem, which is the supply problem. Mm. Well, well, now when he talks about more options, you, you mentioned first time owner grants, I suppose there could be stamp duty relief, but I'm wondering if he isn't hinting at giving first home buyers access to their super. Do you think that would be a good idea? Again, it's a short term fix. Um, but the super uh, superannuation is there uh, for a reason, which is to be able to provide um, funds in settlement. Uh, sorry, in retirement for for people to live on. And um, so there would have to be fairly tight regulations that any money that goes into into um, a home from their super needs to go back into super once the property is sold. Mm, well, that said, if if that happened, I guess we have the problem you identified a couple of minutes ago, which is if you suddenly give all these first home buyers an extra twenty grand from their super, it's it's almost like giving them a a twenty thousand dollar grant. And as you said, all that does is just push up the price of homes because it adds to demand without increasing supply. Yeah, it, it's, it just makes the problem, the existing problem, worse. And another thing Senator Bragg said was that the inquiry will, quote, consider eligibility, eligibility barriers to first home finance such as HEX, which seems to suggest he feels lenders should have the option to ignore HEX debts during their serviceability assessments. I'm wondering, Owen, what do you think of that? Would, would that be a good idea? Well, it's, um, well, they can't. <laughs> he, doesn't, <laughs> he doesn't understand lending then. Um, and yes, and if the banks are, uh, are told that they have to ignore it, um, then they will, they will just assess the income in a different way, which won't ignore it, but they're not directly 
taking into account hex because they have to take into account the net income um, that a borrower borrower will receive and can use for repaying a loan as well as living expenses so it's um if there's hex debt that is eating into their their take-home income their take-home pay then it has to be taken into account so it, it, another politician out, out of touch of you yeah, of reality and how to go about fixing it well Yes, um, we always seem to come back to the same place when we have these discussions about what politicians should do and inquiries, because I think we all want more first first home buyers into the market. But if they're struggling to enter the market, it's because prices are too high. And the only way to solve the prices too high problem is for prices to go down. You, you can't come up with magical things that somehow keep prices where they are, but but just magically allow first home buyers to, to somehow ignore reality and, and buy anyway. So if we think we need to solve the problem of, of first home buyers struggling to enter the market because prices are too high, that means we need prices to come down. And the only way for prices to come down, as we've talked about many, many times, is for supply to increase. But I'm always sceptical about the two big parties pursuing policies that are going to lead to prices going down because one third of voters are renters, two thirds of voters are owners, and the yep. two thirds uh, outweigh the one third. So I, I'm wondering if this isn't just politicians wanting to be seen to be doing something, but ultimately not wanting to address the root cause. Yes, well, well, the, the fact is property prices can't come down from an economic point of view because um, to be able to justify new properties being built, we need to keep the prices at the levels that they currently are because we're we're only just at the sort of the value of building uh, new properties. So you, because of the rising costs of labour costs and building materials, to be able to, even if the, the cost of land went down, um, we need pro the, the value of the properties to keep going up to be able to cover the cost of building new properties. So this is part of the issue on the supply side. So um, if if we supplied a lot more land availability, then, then that portion might go down. Uh, but because the cost of the building materials and the labor cost has gone up, it's uh, we need the value of the properties to, to at least stay where they are. And maybe rise modestly to stay in line with inflation, uh, which is very reasonable to expect. And um, uh, but at the same time, it's yes, we need to help people get into the market. But over time, if we can have real wages growth happen to be able to catch up and overtake uh, the increase of the value of properties, then that's how we can help the first home buyers and any buyers get into the market of owning their own home um, but this is something that will happen over time and slowly so at, at so the the uh, the answer always comes back to fixing the supply problem supply and demand and that's actually a nice lead into our final story rents go backwards SQM Research has reported the capital city asking rents fell 0.5% in the month to August 12. This is just one month's data and it is just for, capital, for the capital cities, but SQM Managing Director Louis Christopher believes it captures a trend. To quote Louis Christopher, for the past 30 days, SQM Research has recorded the largest decline in capital city rents since the days of 2020 when COVID first hit the country. The falls were broad-based, with the larger falls recorded in our larger capital cities and regional coastal locations. It should be noted, of course, that rents are still very high, and this retracement is minor compared to the massive rise in rents recorded around the country since 2021. And it should also be stated that the rental crisis is still not yet over, 
as we have recorded an ongoing low national rental vacancy rate of just 1.3%. But still, this will be somewhat welcoming to tenants and as a research house, we do believe the market rental rises of 10 to 20% per annum are now over. Owen, Louis Christopher has reported a broad-based softening in rental conditions. I know that your business, Lee Field, manages properties in five different states. Are you and Lee Field seeing the same thing as Louis Christopher? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we started seeing it happen about three, four months ago, uh, especially in the Perth market. Um, and also now in um, in the Brisbane market, um, so and, and we'll call that Southeast Queensland in general. So it's uh, in Perth market uh, in in some pockets, it's definitely um, come back in price, um, and whether that's short lived, we don't know because there's been a lot of um, time will tell with uh, a lot of new stock coming on the market in uh, the greater perth region um in in brisbane yes there's been a lot of properties um coming on the market but it's uh it's not necessarily going backwards um in a lot of areas there's maybe one or two pockets where there's a lot of new stock that's come onto the market but um it, it's it's very much softening and having a nice soft landing i think um in general uh, rents will still continue to rise in in Brisbane and southeast Queensland, but at a much slower pace, which is nice to see. You know, if, if and I absolutely agree with the um, you know ten to twenty percent rent rises are are, are, are gone, um, and it's um, but we'll still have pockets where that does happen, and and but it's more likely in across the board in general we'll just be seeing um, single digit growth um, in sydney it's been fairly flat but still still uh, easy to rent there's still good demand yes we've got that very low vacancy rate across the board and um, uh, but yeah rents aren't going backwards in sydney um, melbourne is an interesting one it's um um, there's actually starting to see some buying activity in Melbourne. So it's people might be finally seeing the fact that um, Melbourne is um, been a bit unloved by investors in the last number of years. And um, there's some pockets, um, speaking to buyers agents, there's some pockets where um, they're becoming popular. Um, but again, rents are... I uh, still aren't fantastic in Melbourne. Um, they still haven't grown a lot, um, and but it's still low vacancy rate, and it's um, uh, looking interesting in the Melbourne market. Mm, okay, well, I've got a supply and demand question for you. Uh, yep. The SQM data showed that capital city rents went backwards even though the vacancy rate stayed at 1.3%, which was the same as the month before and the same as the year before. So, Owen, given that the vacancy rate is incredibly low and has remained unchanged, how could rents have gone backwards? Well, you're, you're seeing um, more... Uh, uh, let, let's just um, have a bit of a refresher here. When when there's when they talk about the national vacancy rate of being one point three percent, that that's that's across the board. That's an mm. that's an average all across the board. Um, but in in some particular markets, there could be a vacancy rate of um, three or four percent at at any one time. So what will happen is rents will come will will come back by. Um, will will fall by maybe five or ten percent in those areas um, to be able to take up that supply. So, uh, and that that's where uh, renters can maybe look at maybe outside of the particular area that they're in now if they if they're needing to move to go. Okay, well, where can I go and get um, a better property uh, for the same price or maybe even cheaper? Uh, in an area where there is some oversupply at the moment. And it's um, so 
there will be areas where there'll be higher vacancy rates and there'll be other areas where there's a lot lower. So this is an average at the 1.3%. And so it's not everywhere that rents are going backwards, but it is on average because there are um, quite a few uh, small markets where there are uh, there, there is that oversupply of, of new stock on the market and rents are coming back. Um, and that's what's um, skewing the figures. And I think it's the start of a, a longer term trend. And, and I think it's where we will start to see a, a softening in the market. And maybe in the next uh, six months, maybe six to nine months, we might see that vacancy rate start to um, increase a bit. And so we might start as as we are starting to get more stock on the market. Um, it will start to increase, but time will tell. Like it, this might be a short lived scenario as well, where um, there's still not enough properties being built. And it's just that there's a lot more investor activity in some of the cheaper markets to be able to allow for for this to happen. And talking to a lot of buyers agents now, there are uh, a lot of them are pulling out of buying in the Perth market. And because we've seen this uh, rise in prices, and now are starting to see a drop in rents. Um, but if they all do that on mass, and this is really the first time we've seen uh, the the buyers uh, buyers agent community as a, as an industry act on mass to be buying up in any any particular uh, area, and and they're doing it. In, in, it's not just been in Perth; it's been in Adelaide; it's been in. Um, uh, you know some regional areas of Queensland as well as well as well as Brisbane, and so um, they all change from market to market. So, but it seems like everyone was in Perth, and now everyone's starting to get out of Perth. So it'll be interesting to see what effect that has in six months' time on on the rental market. If all of that this current stock that is um, for rental is taken up. And then it's all of a sudden we've got a, a much lower vacancy rate um, in in those areas again. Supply and demand. Yes, that's what it all comes down to and trying to balance it. Well, that was well, a that great was... chat, Owen. Really, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your expert insights. I've noted the fact that you want to raise all of our taxes, but it was still nice talking to you. <laughs> Not everyone's taxes. Yeah, just the people who can afford it. Okay well, okay, well, something for something all of us for... to think about. And assuming we still have listeners next week, I will see you next week. All right. Thanks, Nick. Bye. Bye.